Hello everyone, Professor Helmling here. Today uh, with this video I want to talk about features of academic writing and we're going to do this by looking at one of the essays from our field guide called Finland School Success. Now if you don't have your field guide I will provide a link to read this article online as well. It does come from one of my favorite publications, The Atlantic. Uh, it's a magazine that's been running for over a century um, and is now online with great articles every weekday, so you should check that out. Now, according to our field guide editors, academic writing should include a couple of different features. And they say it should include evidence that you as the author have considered your subject carefully, should include a response to what others have said about the topic you're writing about, a clear and appropriately qualified thesis, good reasons supported by solid evidence for your position on the subject, acknowledgement of multiple perspectives, proof that you're thinking through the different ways of approaching your topic, a confident authoritative stance, your kind of um, general approach to the topic should be confident and authoritative, carefully documented sources, and careful attention to correctness. Now this is quite a list and these are very broad statements and this is not exactly a very helpful checklist of what do I want to make sure I'm doing when I'm writing academically. But in here are a number of good ideas, a lot of them that overlap. And so uh, if you notice, we've got a lot of similarity in some of these. They talk about evidence, they talk about being careful. And so I would really sum this up, all this list, as what you want in academic writing is careful thinking based on evidence. That's what really makes academic writing stand out. So let's keep that in mind as we look through this first sample passage. Now, like I said, this article um, is in our field guide. And in the field guide, it is uh, identified as a text that mixes genres. So we've already talked a little bit, at least, uh, at least from the syllabus and discussion there, about the different genres that we'll be writing in. I'm going to say that more than anything, this text is an argument text that is making an argument about education. And I'll point out as we read through this passage uh, exactly where I think is the strongest case for that. And we'll also see why um, it, it has some different features as well. So let's look at how she begins. She says at the beginning of her essay, Everyone agrees the United States needs to improve its education system dramatically, but how? One of the hottest trends in education reform lately is looking at the stunning success of the West's reigning education superpower, Finland. Trouble is, when it comes to the lessons that Finnish schools have to offer, most of the discussion seems to be missing the point. All right, so here in this first paragraph, you can kind of see her doing a few of the things that we expect out of academic writing. She's acknowledging what other people think about an issue. She's identifying this problem. Uh, and she's kind of telling us what she thinks about it with a little bit of a thesis here. But that thesis is not clearly qualified yet. Um, we could certainly uh, go into a lot more detail than most of the discussion seems to be missing the point. She's not telling us exactly what the point is yet. So we don't have a clearly qualified thesis. And also her discussion of what others think here is very brief. In fact, this whole paragraph is very, very short. Now, the main reason for this is that though we're talking about the expectations of academic writing, the Atlantic is not an academic publication. It's not like an academic journal, a scholarly journal that um, you know, social scientists or, or someone like that would go to read. It is a popular publication, as in for the, for the populace as a whole, for people in general to read. So really, this is not 
strictly speaking, academic writing, but it does have a lot of features, and that's one of the great things about our field guide is that it mixes a lot of different models for you to learn from. Um, it's got published pieces like this from established authors, um, and it also has academic writing from students like yourselves from around the country. So um, this, this is an interesting model for us to learn from. And so, like I said, we don't have a clear, really precise thesis here in the introduction. Now, from your high school writing classes, that's probably what you've been coached to do, usually, is put your thesis, your statement about, this is what I'm saying in this essay, right in the introduction. And here, Partinen isn't doing that. Now, why isn't she doing that? Well, as you're going to see, she certainly does have a clear and qualified thesis, but she's going to layer it on for us. She's going to build up to it. So watch for how she develops that. Let's continue. The small Nordic country of Finland used to be known, if it was known for anything at all, as the home of Nokia, the mobile phone giant. But lately, Finland has been attracting attention on global surveys of quality of life. Newsweek ranked it number one last year. And Finland's national education system has been receiving particular praise because in recent years, Finnish students have been turning in some of the highest test scores in the world. So you see how this builds on the first paragraph. The first paragraph in introduced the idea that people looking to reform education in the United States are starting to look to Finland as an example. And so she did that very briefly in that little opening teaser paragraph. And now she's starting to explain well, why is that? Okay, so here one of the reasons is that Finland keeps ranking very high on quality of life. She also refers to Finnish education scores are looking really good. And she's going to expand on that in the next paragraph. So she's building up her argument. Finland schools owe their newfound fame primarily to one study, the PISA survey, conducted every three years by the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development. The survey compares 15-year-olds in different countries in reading, math, and science. Finland has ranked at or near the top in all three competencies on every survey since 2000, neck and neck with super achievers such as super South Korea and Singapore. In the most recent survey in 2009, Finland slipped slightly, with students in Shanghai, China taking the best scores, but the Finns are still near the very top. Throughout the same period, the piece of performance of the United States has been middling at best. Okay, so now we really get into what we want to and expect to see in academic writing, evidence. She's done her homework. She's got these numbers and these results from these, the PISA survey to back up why Finland is a powerful um, example for education reform in America. So this is the main thing we want to see in academic writing is that our thinking is backed up by evidence. So she's got that here. Let's continue. Compared with the stereotypes of the East Asian model, long hours of exhaustive cramming and rote memorization, Finland's success is especially intriguing because Finnish schools assign less homework and engage children in more creative play. All this has led to a continuous stream of foreign delegations making the pilgrimage to Finland to visit schools and talk with the nation's education experts, and constant coverage in the worldwide media marveling at the Finnish miracle. Now remember, one of the things our textbook editor said that we want in academic writing is multiple perspectives. Look how in this paragraph she's acknowledging different ways of looking at education. She's talked about how America's test scores are mm, not that great. And she said Finland's doing great, but earlier, if you look back in the previous page, she also referred to super achievers in Singapore and South Korea. And so here we go, compared with the stereotypes of the East Asian model. Oh, she also mentioned China. So these East Asian countries have great test scores too. But here she's comparing the approaches of the Finnish school system to these school systems, which are based on long hours of cramming and memorization, whereas Finland's school approach is very different. And that's going to be a key theme that she's going to develop, is what makes Finland's education system so different. 
So again, she's acknowledging perspectives and she's got some evidence in her pocket here. Let's continue. She says, so there was considerable interest in a recent visit to the U.S. by one of the leading Finnish authorities on education reform, Posse Solver, director of the Finnish Ministry of Education's Center for International Mobility, and the author of the new book, Finnish Lessons, What the World Can Learn from Educational Change in Finland. Earlier this month, Salberg stopped by the Dwight School in New York City to speak with educators and students, and his visit received national media attention and generated much discussion. And yet, it wasn't clear that Salberg's message was actually getting through. As Salberg put it to me later, there are certain things nobody in America really wants to talk about. Now, look at the move she's making here. And by the way, if you haven't already heard me talk about this in another video or face-to-face, uh, -face, depending on how this class is meeting, um, I use that language a lot. I talk about the moves that authors make, the little choices that they make in crafting their pieces. So we've already seen her set up Finland as an example and compare it to the East Asian model. But now here in this big paragraph where she says, so there was, she's doing something different. She's introducing an individual figure to us. And notice that she establishes all his credentials and why he's an important person to listen to. But she's also starting to kind of set up a narrative thread here, like a little story within the essay. So this is a structural change she's making here. Before she'd been talking in general with general statistics and figures, and now she's got a person. She's putting a face and a voice to this issue, this expert, Posse Solberg, and his visit to New York. She's gonna tell us what happens when he comes to New York and gives this big talk at the Dwight School in New York City. But also notice this little move she makes in this tiny little paragraph at the bottom of our screen here. And yet it wasn't clear that Solberg's message was actually getting through. This connects directly back to the way that she stated the issue before. If you look back at the beginning here, most of the discussion seems to be missing the point. So again, she hasn't come right out and stated her thesis, but she's teasing us with this idea that, yes, people are looking at Finland, but they're not taking away the real lesson that they need to. And so, of course, she's kind of building this up for us almost with suspense, right? It was like, well, what is that lesson? What is it that the people in America don't really want to talk about? So it's a different approach to her main idea, a different way to present her thesis. She teases us with it at the beginning instead of stating it outright in full qualified form. But as you're going to see, it gets built up more and more. And by the end, we certainly really understand what her thesis is. All right, let's continue with the essay now that she's got Solberg in here and she's kind of telling the story of his visit. During the afternoon that Solberg spent at the Dwight School, a photographer from the New York Times jockeyed for position with Dan Rather's TV crew as Solberg participated in a roundtable chat with students. The subsequent article in the Times about the event would focus on Finland as an intriguing school reform model. Yet one of the most significant things that Solberg said passed practically unnoticed. Oh, he mentioned at one point, and there are no private schools in Finland. This notion may seem difficult for an American to digest, but it's true. Only a small number of independent schools exist in Finland, and even they are all publicly financed. None is allowed to charge tuition fees. There are no private universities either. This means that practically every person in Finland attends public school, whether for pre-K or a PhD. The irony of Solberg's making this comment during a talk at the Dwight School seems obvious. Like many of America's best schools, Dwight is a private institution that costs high school students upward of $35,000 a year to attend. Not to mention that Dwight, in particular, is run for profit, an increasing trend in the United States. Yet no one in the room commented on Solberg's statement. I found this surprising. Solberg himself did not. So here she's getting more detail about what is it that we miss about Finnish education. And she's pointing out a big difference between the American system and the Finnish system. America has these private schools, for example. Some of the best high schools in the country are actually private schools that cost, in this case, $35,000 a year. But she's also talking about how some schools in the United States are run for profit. And yet in Finland, there's none of that. 
Now she's surprised that people don't pick up on this. Salberg, she says, is not. Let's continue with her story about Salberg's visit and her obvious interview with Salberg to figure out why. Salberg knows what Americans like to talk about when it comes to education because he's become their go-to guy in Finland. The son of two teachers, he grew up in a Finnish school. He taught mathematics and physics in a junior high school in Helsinki, worked his way through a variety of positions in the Finnish Ministry of Education, and spent years as an education expert at the OECD, the World Bank, and other international organizations. Now, in addition to his other duties, Solberg hosts about 100 visits a year by foreign educators, including many Americans, who want to know the secret of Finland's success. Solberg's new book is partly an attempt to help answer the questions he always gets asked. From his point of view, Americans are frequently, consistently obsessed with certain questions. Now, I want to pause here and talk about word choice and talk about tone. Now, in some ways, this piece sounds like a report, that she's just reporting on the situation, right? That she's telling us, hey, this is happening. People are looking at Finland as an example. Oh, and this guy Salberg visited. I'm reporting this information to you. Remember at the beginning of the video, I said that I really think more than anything, this piece is an argument. She's going to make an argument about what American schools should do different, what they should learn from Finland. Now, why do I think it's more of an argument than just a reporting? She's giving us a lot of information. She's not explicitly telling us this is the way it should be yet. But look at the word choice. And this is a powerful lesson for you about your writing. Word choice matters so much. Our tone and the connotations of the words we choose helps us to craft our message to our readers. So when she uses the word obsessed, that is her showing her hand. That is her beginning to really lean towards argument. Because is obsession good? Is obsession positive? Now, if we're obsessed with something, that's not healthy, right? And so that he is described as saying that America is obsessed with these certain questions kind of implies that both he and, by extension, our author, Anu Partinen, are kind of looking down on Americans for thinking this way about education. So let's look at what these questions we're obsessed with in American education are. How can you keep track of students' performance if you don't test them constantly? How can you improve teaching if you have no accountability for bad teachers or merit pay for good teachers? How do you foster competition and engage in the private engage the private sector? How do you provide school choice? So you may not understand the full weight of all these questions depending on how familiar you are with education and how it's changed in the United States over the last couple of decades. Um, as a teacher who's been teaching for all of those decades, I can tell you these questions really sum up the direction of American educational reform as we've gone to lots of tests and lots of pressure on teachers and lots of focus on um, you know the private sector and quite a bit of emphasis from certain voices in the political spectrum about, oh, we should provide school choice. People should be able to pick and choose from their schools. So these questions really sum up the American attitude towards education right now. And he's saying those are different questions than what Finns ask at their schools. So the answers Finland provides seem to run counter to just about everything America's school reformers are trying to do. For starters, Finland has no standardized tests. Can I get a hallelujah? All right, the only exception is what's called the National Matriculation Exam, which everyone takes at the end of a voluntary upper secondary school, roughly the equivalent of American high school. Instead, the public school system's teachers are trained to assess children in classrooms using independent tests they create themselves. All children receive a report card at the end of each semester, but these reports are based on individualized grading by each teacher. Periodically, the Ministry of Education tracks national progress by testing a few sample groups across a range of different schools. So the first question that's being addressed here is testing, 
which has become super important in American schools, or at least was before the pandemic. Now there may be some changes coming. But it's been super important for the last two decades in American education, and Finland doesn't use them, doesn't use these tests at all. And of course, the interesting thing, if I can just editorialize a little bit with my own point of view, the interesting thing about these tests is America has been obsessed with these tests. And yet, on international comparisons, these tests haven't helped us get better. So, how does Finland do it differently? Well, they have individualized grading by teachers. And what's interesting is that studies in the United States have shown that grades actually are best predictor of student achievement after school, too. So this makes sense based on other evidence. Okay, but let's focus on her argument. I'm adding too much of my own argument in here, so let's focus on hers. The next point is teachers. As for accountability of teachers and administrators, Solberg shrugs. There's no word for accountability in Finnish, he later told an audience at the Teachers College of Columbia University. Accountability is something that is left when responsibility has been subtracted. For Solberg, what matters is that in Finland, all teachers and administrators are given prestige decent pay, and a lot of responsibility. A master's degree is required to enter the profession, and teacher training programs are among the most selective professional schools in the country. If a teacher is bad, it's the principal's responsibility to notice and deal with it. And while Americans love to talk about competition, Solberg points out that nothing makes Finns more uncomfortable. In his book, Solberg quotes a line from Finnish writer named Samuel Lee Parnanen. Real winners do not compete. It's hard to think of a more un-American idea, but when it comes to education, Finland's success shows that the Finnish attitude might have merits. There are no lists of best schools or teachers in Finland. The main driver in education policy is not competition between teachers and between schools, but cooperation. Finally, in Finland, school choice is noticeably not a priority, nor is engaging the private sector at all. Which brings us back to the silence after Solberg's comment at the Dwight School that schools like Dwight don't exist in Finland. Here in America, Solberg said at the Teachers College, parents can choose to take their kids to private schools. It's the same idea of a marketplace that applies to, say, shops. Schools are a shop, and parents can buy whatever they want. In Finland, parents can also choose, but the options are all the same. But I'm fun. Okay, so look at the type of evidence that she's using here. Now, earlier in the essay, we saw a lot of statistical evidence, some moral comparisons. Now, a lot of the evidence is perspective, a lot of it coming from Solberg. She's really using him as the vehicle for all of her evidence in the middle section of this essay. Okay, so that is a choice, a structural choice that she's making to use Solberg as the vehicle to bring out all these ideas. Now again, I'm arguing that she backs these ideas, that we're going to see she believes in these ideas, and that her main message in this essay is we should listen to Solberg and the Finns in America. Uh, and I already pointed out some of the word choice that she's using that I think reveals that that's her real purpose here. Remember, she still hasn't told us her full qualified thesis. We just have hints of it. So let's continue and see how she develops it. Herein lay the real shocker. As Solberg continued, his core message emerged, whether or not anyone in his American audience heard it. Decades ago, when the Finnish school system was badly in need of reform, the goal of the program that Finland instituted, resulting in so much success today, was never excellence. It was equity. Since the 1980s, the main driver of Finnish education policy has been the idea that every child should have exactly the same opportunity to learn, regardless of family background, income, or geographic location. Education has been seen first and foremost not as a way to produce star performers, but as an instrument to even out social inequality. So now we're really getting to it. This is what she just identified as Solberg's core point. Okay, so this is really closely tied to her main argument. In the Finnish view, as Solberg describes it, this means that schools should be healthy, safe environments for children. This starts with the basic. Finland offers all pupils free school meals, easy access to health care, psychological counseling, and individualized student guidance. In fact, since academic excellence wasn't a particular priority on the Finnish to-do list, when Finland's students scored so high on the first PISA survey in 2001, many Finns thought the results must be a mistake.
but subsequent PISA tests confirmed that Finland, unlike, say, very similar countries such as Norway, was producing academic excellence through its particular policy focus on equity. That this point is almost always ignored or brushed aside in the U.S. seems especially poignant at the moment, after the financial crisis and Occupy Wall Street movements have brought the problems of inequality in America into such sharp focus. The chasm between those who can afford $35,000 in tuition per child per year, or even just the price of a house in a good public school district, and the other 99% is painfully plain to see. Now, she's again writing in 2011 after the big financial crisis in 2008, but this idea of uh, inequality and inequity in American schools and in American society is still very, very prominent. Uh, it's something that came up, uh, I'm, I'm recording this video at the end of summer in 2020 where we've just had the pandemic and a resurgence of the Black Lives Matter movement, both of which focused a lot on inequality because we're seeing how people with a uh, different economic background had access to better health care, uh, people with different um, backgrounds had better access to uh, the, the good resources in the criminal justice system, things like that. So this uh, emphasis on inequality is still very much part of the debate about the nature of American society. And when it comes to education, most of our education dollars are funded through property taxes. So you can see the inequality there, the inequity, is that if you go to school in a district with high property values, big houses, rich families, well then that school is going to have more money and more resources. So that's a big problem. And she's really pointing out how it's at odds with the way that Finland has achieved such success here. Let's see how she continues to develop this. Posse Salberg goes out of his way to emphasize that his book, Finnish Lessons, is not meant as a how-to guide for fixing the education systems of other countries. All countries are different. And as many Americans point out, Finland is a small nation with a much more homogenous population than the United States. Now remember, one of the things we expect academic writing to do is acknowledge other perspectives and to pay attention to what other people have said about the issue. So look at what she's doing here. She's doing exactly that. She says, you know what some people say is Finland is a little country, a little Nordic country. You can't compare Finland to the United States. And what she's really setting up here, and one of the reasons I say this is an argument essay, She's really setting up a counter-argument. Counter-argument is when you acknowledge what somebody who disagrees with you says, but then you take it apart and you refute it so that it's still able to back up your argument. Okay, so the two basic moves of counter-argument are concession, yes, people say this, and then refutation. But in reality, this is the case. So let's see how she does that. Yet Salberg doesn't think that questions of size or homogeneity, homogeneity should give Americans reason to dismiss the Finnish example. Finland is a relatively homogenous country. As of 2010, just 4.6% of Finnish residents had been born in another country, compared with 12.7% in the United States. But the number of foreign-born residents in Finland doubled during the decade leading up to 2010, and the country didn't lose its edge in education. Immigrants tended to concentrate in certain areas, causing some schools to become much more mixed than others. Yet there has not been much change in the remarkable lack of variation between Finnish schools in the PISA surveys across the same period. So one the complaint, the point that people made was, oh, well, Finland's not as uh, diverse as America. And so she points out, well, it's become more diverse, and that growing diversity didn't affect its score. So she's counter-arguing here. Samuel Abrams, a visiting scholar at Columbia University's Teachers College, has addressed the effects of size and homogeneity on a nation's education performance by comparing Finland with another Nordic country, Norway. Like Finland, Norway is small and not especially diverse overall. But unlike Finland, it has taken an approach to education that is more American than Finnish. The result? Mediocre performance in the PISA survey. Educational policy, Abrams suggests, is probably more important to the success of a country's school system than the nation's size or ethnic makeup. So again, another counter-argument, and again, evidence. What really makes this, a use, this essay a useful model to us for our academic writing is how well she's using evidence to make these points. Here, since she's rested so much on Saulberg so long, she brings in another expert 
to make a comparison between Finland and Norway. They are similar countries that took very dissimilar approaches to education reform. Norway followed America's example. It's like, let's try some testing. And she's pointing out Finland's approach worked better. Posse Solberg goes out of his way to emphasize that his book, Finnish Lessons, is not meant as a how- Oh, sorry. <laughs> I started reading the page again. Sorry. No, what I wanted to flag there is that this is, as we said, acknowledgement of multiple perspectives. Okay, on this page, we get a lot of that. Okay, now let's move on to the next page. Indeed, Finland's population of 5.4 million can be compared to many in American state. After all, most American education is managed at the state level. According to the Migration Policy Institute, a research organization in Washington, there are 18 states in the United States in 2010 with an identical or significantly smaller percentage of foreign-born residents than Finland. So here she's continuing to make this counter-argument. She's saying, listen, you can compare Finland to the United States because while Finland's a small country, the United States is a lot of states. And some states are, you know, similarly diverse or even less diverse than Finland. And since it's states that manage education, the comparison applies. What's more, despite their many differences, Finland and the U.S. have an educational goal in common. When Finnish policymakers decided to reform the country's education system in the 1970s, they did so because they realized that to be competitive, Finland couldn't rely on manufacturing or its scant natural resources, and instead had to invest in a knowledge-based economy. With America's manufacturing industries now in decline, the goal of educational policy in the U.S., as articulated by most everyone from President Obama on down, is to preserve American competitive by doing the same thing. Finland's experience suggests that to win at that game, a country has to prepare not just some of its population well, but all of its population well for the new economy. To possess some of the best schools in the world might still not be good enough if there are children being left behind. By the way, that wording is very deliberate, children being left behind. Um, this change in American education policy where we went to testing and accountability for teachers and this kind of get tough mentality about education was really best embodied in the 2001 legislation called No Child Left Behind, which again, now 20 years later, we've got good comparisons with the rest of the world and we've seen our progress and we've made none and we have left children behind. So she's kind of getting a dig in with that line there. Another example of a move the authors make and one that I think here really reveals her argumentative purpose, because she's, she's basically taking a pot shot at No Child Left Behind, which is the flagship law with testing and all of these things that America has tried to do to make education better that hasn't worked. Is that an impossible goal? Salberg says that while his book isn't meant to be a how-to manual, it is meant to be a pamphlet of hope. When President Kennedy was making his appeal for advancing American science and technology by putting a man on the moon by the end of the 1960s, many said it couldn't be done, Sauberg said during his visit to New York. Remember, we're still in this story mode where she's telling the story of his visit. But he had a dream, just like Martin Luther King a few years later had a dream. Those dreams came true. Uh, well, maybe partly. Finland's dream was that we want to have a good public education for every child, regardless of where they go to school or what kind of families they come from. And many, even in Finland, said it couldn't be done. Now here, we're leaving Salberg's voice behind in the next paragraph now. And this is where, really, Partinen is showing her hand. Clearly, many were wrong. It is possible to create equality. See how this feels much more argumentative? And perhaps even more important, as a challenge to the American way of thinking about education reform, Finland's experience shows that it is possible to achieve excellence by focusing not on competition, but on cooperation. And not on choice, but on equity. The problem facing education in America isn't the ethnic diversity of the population, but the economic inequality of society. And this is precisely the problem that Finnish education reform addressed. More equity at home might just be what America needs to be more competitive abroad. So finally, she gives us her thesis, her clearly qualified thesis. Notice here that even here in the end, as she's making this case, after saying clearly many were wrong, notice that she's still being very diplomatic with her word choice. More equity at home might just be. Okay, so she's challenging some fundamental things about the American school system throughout this essay. 
And so her approach of holding off on the thesis and building up the evidence layer by layer to make this case and to point out just how much America's school system isn't getting it right uh, is very deliberate and very diplomatic. Also, I think kind of very European. It's like she's trying not to be rude. <laughs> so she builds up the case and then comes to this final conclusion at the end. Um, and by the time she really states this thesis outright here in the final page, we really have a lot of evidence to accept it and, and acknowledge that, oh yeah, gosh, America's school system isn't getting it done. Maybe we should be listening to this example. So uh, again, I think this is clearly overall argumentative. Um, yes, she reports a lot of information. Yes, she's presenting Salberg's visit and all this stuff. But really the point she wants to make is this final point here. And uh, I think she makes it pretty well. Now, before we uh, wrap up talking about this example, though, um, there's one other element of academic writing that I want to talk about, and that is structure. When we talk about structure, we're talking about the organization of ideas in the essay. And one of the best ways, or at least one of the most common ways to think about this is, is in outlines, breaking down the structure of an essay in an outline. Uh, it's something that you'll often be asked to do as you prepare to write an essay. And I really like to look at our model essays and ask, okay, what are they doing with their structure? So here with Partinen, she starts by identifying the problem that America's schools, everybody agrees, need to get better. Everybody agrees that, with this, she says. So she identifies the problem. And then she very quickly establishes Finland as a model. And remember, we had those paragraphs early on, talking about Finland's success, comparing them to the East Asian model, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And then a big structural move, a big choice she makes is she uses Salberg as a vehicle to discuss Finland's system. The whole middle of the essay is Salberg's visit and his discussion and how his discussion reveals some key things about the comparison. For example, um, how in America there's a big focus on choice and accountability and testing. And then by contrast, Finland is focused on equity. So that's really the heart of the essay is that she uses Salberg to do all of that. And then it's at the end that she brings all of this together to make her final conclusion, which is her well-qualified thesis, something we expect to see in academic writing there. So uh, I just wanted to look at that structure in a very broad sense here. It's a very short outline of the main points in her essay to get a sense of how she's choosing to do that because think it's a pretty effective structure and we talked about how it delays the thesis there and by the time she does bring it there's a ton of evidence to really help us accept it. So that's a quick breakdown of this sample text. Again it's in your field guide um, and you can look at it as a model for your own writing in the future. I think she does a lot of things well especially her use of evidence. We talked at the beginning of this video about how careful use of evidence to show our thinking is the really central thing we want to do in academic writing. So keep that in mind as we move into looking at different genres for your own writing. And uh, we will look at other model texts in similar depth soon. Thanks and take care.